Nowadays, to secure the presidency in the United States, a candidate must demonstrate their relatability by indulging in relatable activities, like sharing a beer with the public. However, the leaders who held office during the 18th and 19th centuries followed a starkly different path. In stark contrast to the refined society we know today, the historical accounts of American presidents may evoke a sense of tragedy. A significant number of them grappled with the relentless grip of alcohol, proving nearly powerless against their addictive demons. In their solitary battles, they inflicted irreparable damage upon their livers and left indelible stains upon their political legacies. Please join us in reviewing the embarrassing faces in the list of U.S. presidents in history. George W. Bush George W. Bush's relationship with alcohol is a notable chapter in his life, marked by periods of excessive drinking, questionable behavior, and eventual sobriety. While it may be debatable whether he had a full-fledged alcohol addiction, there is no doubt that his consumption of alcohol led to numerous issues and had a significant impact on his life. Bush's history of alcohol misuse can be traced back to his college days at Yale, where he gained notoriety for his drunken frat boy antics, often overshadowing his academic achievements. However, it was after leaving college that his alcohol-related problems became less amusing and more concerning. Many of his friends have testified to his tendency to binge drink, unable to stop once he started, which is a common characteristic of alcohol misuse. One of the most infamous incidents in George W. Bush's life related to alcohol occurred when he was around the age of 30. He was pulled over for drunk driving, resulting in a DUI, driving under the influence charge. This incident not only led to a fine and the temporary suspension of his driver's license, but also became a significant point of political controversy when it was uncovered by the press during his campaign for the presidency in 2000. The public scrutiny of his past actions, including his struggles with alcohol, added an extra layer of complexity to his political career. Another incident that brought his issues with alcohol into the public eye took place in 1986. While heavily intoxicated, Bush confronted a Wall Street Journal reporter in a hostile manner, using profanity and making threats. This episode revealed the darker side of his drinking habits and reinforced concerns about his behavior when under the influence. However, unlike some individuals who grapple with alcohol-related problems and continue down a destructive path, George W. Bush ultimately decided to make a significant change in his life. At the age of 40, he underwent a transformation driven, in part, by his deepening religious faith. One morning, after experiencing an intense hangover, he recognized the need to break free from the cycle of alcohol misuse. This pivotal moment marked the beginning of his journey towards sobriety, a decision that would have a profound impact on his personal life and his future as a public figure. Lyndon B. Johnson Lyndon B. Johnson, a prominent figure in American politics as the 36th President of the United States, had a reputation for his rowdy and sometimes dangerous drinking habits. These habits came under public scrutiny and controversy during the 1960s, shedding light on his propensity for risky behavior involving alcohol. One particularly shocking incident occurred in 1964, when Time magazine exposed that Johnson had engaged in drink driving. He had been out driving at high speeds with a cup of beer conveniently within sipping distance in the car. What made this episode even more startling was the fact that Johnson was not alone. He had a group of reporters as passengers in the car at the time. In a feeble attempt to disguise his reckless driving, he resorted to covering the speedometer with his hat. This public revelation of drunk driving was just one example of his questionable judgment when it came to alcohol. Joseph Califano, in his memoir, Triumph and Tragedy of Lyndon Johnson, recounted another instance of Johnson's risky behavior involving alcohol. Califano claimed to have witnessed the president sipping a drink while on the road. Armed with a plastic cup filled with scotch and soda, 
Johnson had a peculiar routine when he went for a drive. He would slow down the car to allow a Secret Service agent to run up to the vehicle, take the cup from him, and return to a station wagon where another agent would refill it with ice, scotch, and soda. Then, the first agent would rush back to Johnson's car and deliver the refilled cup to the president's outstretched hand. This unusual practice demonstrated the extent to which Johnson was accustomed to consuming alcohol even while on the move. Beyond his penchant for drinking and driving, Johnson also had a routine of finishing his day with a glass of scotch. This daily indulgence in alcohol was a part of his life, reflecting his reliance on alcohol as a means of relaxation or stress relief. However, as the pressures and anxieties related to the Vietnam War began to weigh on him, Johnson decided to change his habits. He recognized the need to maintain full control of his faculties, particularly during a critical period in American history. Consequently, he made the significant decision to slow down and eventually stop his alcohol consumption altogether. Warren G. Harding Warren G. Harding's Presidency while Marquette, by moments of turmoil and scandal, is often remembered for its association with sleaze, illicit affairs, corruption, and illegal liquor. His time in office was a stark contrast to the image he projected during his earlier political career, characterized by questionable behavior and a notable hypocrisy regarding his stance on alcohol. One of the most notorious aspects of Harding's personal life was his involvement in extramarital affairs, which cast a shadow over his presidency. Additionally, his administration was criticized for its cronyism and corrupt practices, leading to a tarnished reputation for the White House. One striking element of Harding's behavior was his hypocrisy when it came to alcohol. Despite having supported prohibition during his time in the Senate, once he assumed the presidency, Harding continued to indulge in alcohol freely. In public, he chastised Americans for not abiding by the prohibition laws, accusing them of supporting bootleggers and frequenting speakeasies. This public stance stood in stark contrast to his private actions, where he often partook in late-night poker parties accompanied by copious amounts of alcohol. One particularly embarrassing incident highlighted Harding's disregard for the law when he arrived at a meeting with a union leader in the Oval Office while visibly intoxicated from whiskey. Such episodes further eroded his credibility and cast him in the role of a hypocritical leader who did not practice what he preached. As suspicions about his drinking habits grew, Harding attempted to conceal his alcohol consumption by hiding a liquor cabinet in his bedroom. However, word eventually spread that he continued to drink, causing significant damage to his reputation as a president. In a last-ditch effort to salvage his image, Harding supposedly attempted to quit drinking in 1923. But by then, it was too late. His reputation was already marred by his association with scandal and corruption. To compound matters, news broke that members of his inner circle, known as the Ohio Gang, were involved in collusion with bootleggers further implicating the administration in illegal activities. Thomas Jefferson Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of the United States and the third president of the nation, had a passion for wine that set him apart from many of his contemporaries. His drinking habits leaned toward the refined and cultured end of the spectrum, as he was truly obsessed with wine and wine collecting throughout his life. His appreciation for this beverage was such that he dedicated numerous pages of notes to the subject, reflecting his deep knowledge and interest in viticulture and enology. Jefferson's love for wine extended beyond mere appreciation. He actively collected and purchased hundreds of bottles throughout his lifetime. He held wine in such high regard that when he found himself running out of it, he expressed considerable distress. In a letter to a wine merchant in 1815, he wrote, Disappointments in procuring supplies have at length left me without a drop of wine. I must therefore request you to send me a quarter cask of the best you have. Wine from long habit has become indispensable for my health, which is now suffering by its disuse. 
This quote highlights both his reliance on wine for its perceived health benefits and his dedication to maintaining a well-stocked wine cellar. One intriguing aspect of Thomas Jefferson's approach to drinking was his preference for wine over heavier spirits. He believed that spirits were responsible for various social ills and advocated for the consumption of lighter, French-style wines as an alternative. He actively promoted the idea that the fashion for drinking such wines should be encouraged among Americans. To advance this cause, he made extensive efforts to cultivate various grape varieties at his Monticello estate, hoping to contribute to the development of the American wine industry. At a time when wine was not particularly popular in the United States, Jefferson imported whatever wines he could to satisfy his refined palate and support his vision for wine in America. Among the many wines he enjoyed, White Hermitage held a special place in Thomas Jefferson's heart. He considered it the finest wine in the world, showcasing his discerning taste and preference for French wines. While serving as acting president, he ordered an astonishing 550 bottles of White Hermitage in a single purchase, ensuring that he had an ample supply of his favorite wine. John Adams John Adams, America's second president, was undoubtedly a man of many accomplishments, both before and during his presidency. However, what might surprise many is the role that alcohol, particularly hard cider, played in his life. Adams had a fondness for alcoholic beverages, and hard cider held a special place in his heart, as he once described it as refreshing and salubrious. This preference for hard cider began during his time at Harvard and remained a constant companion throughout most of his life, even finding a place at his breakfast table on a daily basis. It is evident that alcohol was not merely a passing fancy for Adams, but rather a lifelong companion. This becomes quite apparent when we look at a notable incident in his life. When preparing for his voyage to France on the U.S. frigate Boston, Adams meticulously listed his essential provisions, which included not only the usual necessities, but also a keg of rum, a barrel of Madeira wine, and four dozen bottles of port. It is clear that Adams considered these alcoholic beverages as indispensable as any other supplies for his journey. This list provides a fascinating insight into his relationship with alcohol and the role it played in his life even in the face of important diplomatic missions. Despite his indulgence, Buchanan had the remarkable ability to remain sober and composed, even after consuming large quantities of alcohol. This unusual trait led many to wonder at his resilience in the face of excessive drinking. However, Buchanan's heavy drinking did not come without consequences for his health. Later in life, he suffered from gout, a painful and debilitating condition often associated with excessive alcohol consumption. Gout is characterized by swollen, inflamed joints, and it typically affects those who regularly overindulge in alcohol and rich indulgent foods. Ulysses S. Grant, the 18th President of the United States and a prominent military figure during the American Civil War, had a complicated relationship with alcohol that evolved significantly over the course of his life. His drinking habits, characterized by heavy consumption and periods of excessive indulgence, have been a subject of historical debate. Grant's struggle with alcohol began to surface early in his military career. In 1854, he was compelled to resign from the army due to his excessive drinking, marking one of the first significant consequences of his alcohol-related behavior. Many historians believe that Grant may have been intoxicated for significant portions of the Civil War, which he famously led as the Union's top general. It is worth noting that Grant's early exposure to the heavy drinking culture of the California infantry likely contributed to the development of his drinking habit. Historian W. H. Bran, in his work The Man Who Saved the Union, described the California infantry as having an extreme drinking culture, even by the standards of the time. Officers and soldiers alike were known to be intoxicated regularly, often drinking until the early hours of the morning. An anecdote from a Leo tenant who encountered Grant during this period illustrates the extent of his drinking problem. 
He noted that Grant and his fellow officers would frequently become inebriated after just a few glasses of alcohol, rendering Grant, in particular, vulnerable to the effects of drinking and unable to handle his liquor. The question of how intoxicated Grant was during critical moments of the Civil War remains a subject of historical debate. There are conflicting accounts regarding whether he was drinking before significant battles. Whenever Grant faced difficulties or setbacks during the war, rumors about his drinking tended to circulate in the press. For example, during the Battle of Shiloh and the Vicksburg Campaign, concerns about his alcohol consumption were prominently featured in discussions. However, it is essential to note that some, including Grant's wife, vehemently dismissed these stories as malicious rumors. As Grant transitioned to the presidency, he appeared to have become more or less free from the grip of alcohol. By the time he assumed the sober office of the presidency, he had evidently curbed his drinking habit, signaling a significant change in his lifestyle and behavior. FDR Franklin D. Roosevelt, the 32nd President of the United States, had a well-documented fondness for cocktails and spirits. While he did not regularly engage in excessive drinking, he certainly enjoyed the art of mixing cocktails and experimenting with various concoctions as part of his daily routine. These evening gatherings, which he referred to as the children's hour, were a time for relaxation and camaraderie among friends. Roosevelt's enthusiasm for mixing drinks was a notable aspect of his personal life. He often played the role of the bartender, shaking up cocktails for those in attendance. However, some of his concoctions had rather questionable results. His eccentric martinis, in particular, were forced upon his guests, and they left much to be desired in terms of taste and balance. Even his grandson, Curtis Roosevelt, once humorously remarked that the president made the worst cocktails in the world. Roosevelt's unpredictable approach to mixing spirits, often varying the quantity haphazardly, added to the unpredictability of his creations. The question of how intoxicated Grant was during critical moments of the Civil War remains a subject of historical debate. There are conflicting accounts regarding whether he was drinking before significant battles. Whenever Grant faced difficulties or setbacks during the war, Rumors about his drinking tended to circulate in the press. For example, during the Battle of Shiloh and the Vicksburg Campaign, concerns about his alcohol consumption were prominently featured in discussions. However, it is essential to note that some, including Grant's wife, vehemently dismissed these stories as malicious rumors. As Grant transitioned to the presidency, he appeared to have become more or less free from the grip of alcohol. By the time he assumed the sober office of the presidency, he had evidently curbed his drinking habit, signaling a significant change in his lifestyle and behavior. FDR Franklin D. Roosevelt, the 32nd president of the United States, had a well-documented fondness for cocktails and spirits. While he did not regularly engage in excessive drinking, he certainly enjoyed the art of mixing cocktails and experimenting with various concoctions as part of his daily routine. These evening gatherings, which he referred to as the children's hour, were a time for relaxation and camaraderie among friends. Roosevelt's enthusiasm for mixing drinks was a notable aspect of his personal life. He often played the role of the bartender, shaking up cocktails for those in attendance. However, some of his concoctions had rather questionable results. His eccentric martinis, in particular, were forced upon his guests, and they left much to be desired in terms of taste and balance. Even his grandson, Curtis Roosevelt, once humorously remarked that the president made the worst cocktails in the world. Roosevelt's unpredictable approach to mixing spirits, often varying the quantity haphazardly, added to the unpredictability of his creations. Despite his quirky martinis, Franklin D. Roosevelt made a lasting impact on the world of cocktails. He is credited with popularizing the Dirty Martini, a tangy variation of the classic martini that includes brine from olives. This twist on the classic cocktail has remained a favorite among many to this day. 
In addition to the dirty martini, Roosevelt is known for inventing the Haitian libation. This unique concoction featured dark rum, orange juice, egg white, and brown sugar, showcasing his penchant for experimenting with ingredients and flavors. It remains a subject of debate just how heavy Roosevelt's drinking habits were on a regular basis. Typically, he would enjoy two or three cocktails in the evening after dinner. However, his most notorious drinking episodes occurred in the company of his close friend and ally, Winston Churchill. The two leaders would work late into the night, fueled by Churchill's signature brandy and cigars. These late-night gatherings were legendary, with Roosevelt often needing several days to recover from the spirited and spirited discussions that unfolded. Martin Van Buren Martin Van Buren, the eighth president of the United States, was a man known for his ability to hold his liquor, earning him the affectionate nickname Blue Whiskey Van. His presidency was marked by a series of challenges and disasters, including the financial panic of 1837 and the infamous Trail of Tears, making it perhaps unsurprising that he found solace in alcohol during trying times. Despite his reputation as a drinker, Van Buren possessed an uncanny ability to consume alcohol without displaying the typical signs of inebriation. John R. Bumgarner's book, The Health of the Presidents, sheds light on this aspect of his personality. Van Buren was famous for never appearing drunk, even though he indulged in alcohol quite heavily. This characteristic likely contributed to his nickname, as he managed to maintain a composite demi-nor even when partaking in substantial quantities of liqueur. However, it is important to note that Martin Van Buren was not entirely oblivious to the potential dangers of alcoholism. In a letter to his son, he offered a thoughtful and cautionary perspective on the subject, emphasizing the long-lasting consequences of what might seem like innocent and harmless indulgence. He warned his son that such behavior could tarnish one's public image and take years to overcome in the eyes of society. This advice reflects an element of self-awareness on Van Buren's part, recognizing the fine line between enjoying alcoholic beverages and falling into the pitfalls of addiction. The historical record reveals that Martin Van Buren's consumption of alcohol was not limited to casual social drinking. He had a penchant for wine, port, and Madeira, which over time took a toll on his health. By the time he reached his 50s, he had developed a severe case of gout. Gout is a painful condition often associated with excessive consumption of alcoholic beverages and rich, indulgent foods. Van Buren's struggle with gout serves as a tangible reminder of the physical consequences that can accompany a penchant for alcohol. George Washington George Washington, America's first president, had a drinking habit that set a standard for subsequent precedents and left a lasting impression on the nation's early history. While he is celebrated as a founding father and military leader, his affinity for alcohol is a noteworthy aspect of his life. One of the most extravagant displays of George Washington's drinking habits occurred during the climax of the Constitutional Convention of 1787. He hosted a party attended by 55 others, and together they ran up a bar tab that amounted to 45 gallons of alcohol, a staggering amount by any standard. This bill, equivalent to approximately $15,400 in 2018, as reported by the Washington Post, showcased the wide variety of beverages consumed on that occasion. It included 54 bottles of Madeira, 60 bottles of Claret, 22 bottles of porter, 12 bottles of beer, 8 ciders, and 7 punch bowls. This impressive assortment was more than sufficient to ensure that every attendee could enjoy several bottles of fortified wine, and there was even extra for good measure. An additional bill indicates that the group also extended their generosity to the staff at the city tavern, ensuring that every beyond special occasions, George Washington maintained a steady drinking routine. 
According to Washington Irving's George Washington, A Biography, the president's daily regimen included a beer or cider, followed by several glasses of Madeira after dinner. Beer held a special place in his heart, so much so that he began brewing his own, showcasing his appreciation for the craft. Additionally, he ventured into the world of distilling by opening a whiskey distillery at his Mount Vernon estate. This distillery produced both rye whiskey and brandy, further reflecting his involvement in the production of alcoholic beverages. George Washington's influence even extended to the realm of brewing and recipe creation. One of his beer recipes has been recreated by the Coney Island Brewing Company, though this particular brew had a limited run. This historical connection between Washington and brewing serves as a reminder of his multifaceted interests and contributions to the culture of the time. Franklin Pierce Franklin Pierce, the 14th President of the United States, is often remembered for his troubled presidency and the personal demons that plagued his life, particularly his struggle with severe alcoholism. His tenure in office, marked by controversy, and his own inner turmoil. Miro read the difficulties he faced in his personal life. Pierce's relationship with alcohol was not that of a casual drinker or occasional indulger, but rather one of profound addiction. He grappled with severe alcoholism that had a pervasive and destructive influence on his life and well-being. His descent into alcoholism was a constant struggle that he faced throughout his life, particularly during moments of personal adversity. Although Pierce briefly aligned himself with the temperance movement in the 1840s, his battle with alcoholism persisted. The pressures of his life and the demands of the presidency took a toll on him, and he often turned to the bottle as a coping mechanism. The tragic loss of his only living son around the time of his election as president was a particularly devastating blow that pushed him back into heavy drinking. The presence of a circle of like-minded, heavily drinking friends made it even more challenging for him to overcome his addiction. As Pierce's presidency came to an end, his drinking habits continued to escalate. Historian John R. Bumgarner noted that alcoholism seemed to run in Pierce's family, and the president experienced numerous health complications as a result of his drinking. These included conditions such as neuralgia, a painful nerve disorder, and chronic gastritis, which can be exacerbated by excessive alcohol consumption. Ultimately, it was the bottle that contributed to Franklin Pierce's downfall, and it played a significant role in his tragic demise. In 1869, he succumbed to cirrhosis of the liver, a disease directly linked to chronic alcohol abuse. This marked the end of a life marked by personal struggles, political challenges, and a relentless battle with alcoholism. What do you think about the drinking history of these American presidents? So leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.